Good morning, everyone. I really want to start by just saying welcome back to the Yellen Conference Center. For some reason, I always like having the Macroeconomics and Monetary Policy Conference in this place, and she has been uh, an esteemed servant of, of central banks for a long time, and now the Treasury Secretary, but it's really great to be here. And next year, we're going to be able to bring you through the front door, so don't forget to come next year because we'll actually use our front doors. Now, the Macroeconomics and Monetary Policy Conference is one of the bank's longest standing research events. The conference began in 1976, is an episodic, topic-driven conference where we would focus on things that would allow researchers and policymakers to really talk to each other on foundational topics that were key to macroeconomics and monetary policy, as the title would suggest. But since that time, it's become an annual event. And it's helped us navigate through six recessions, high and low inflation, 9-11, a financial crisis, slow growth, and most recently, a pandemic. Now, I attribute its durability to a very simple fact. Research makes policy better, and policy challenges spur better and more relevant research. And that virtuous cycle and exchange of ideas ensures that our knowledge keeps pace with the economy we have and that we're constantly learning and expanding our minds to prepare and work on the economy we want. Now, today's conference continues that tradition. We will hear about and discuss research on sustainable price stability, inflation, the labor market, and Federal Reserve Communications and Policy Implementation, one of my favorites, actually. And of course, we will hear from the chair of the Fed, Jerome Powell. And these discussions and all of the conversations we have here today among us will help us continue the great tradition of ensuring that policymakers and researchers exchange ideas, debate vigorously, and learn from each other. And that is the way we can collectively contribute to creating a sustainable economy that benefits all. Now, as you can imagine, conferences like this don't make themselves. And so before I go further, I would like to just acknowledge the people who put this year's conference together. Andrew Forrester, Hu Yu Li, and Fernanda Necchio. And I also want to thank the glue of this conference, Margaret Cliver and all of the support teams who continue to make this event and all the other ones like it a great success. But without further ado, I'm going to get to what you all are waiting for, which is to introduce the chair of the Fed, my colleague, friend, and someone who has really helped us navigate through completely challenging times. Chair Powell has a quite distinguished career of public service. It spans four presidential administrations, which in and of itself is a remarkable accomplishment. In the early 1990s, he served as Assistant Secretary and Undersecretary of the U.S. Department of the Treasury. He returned to public service in 2012 when he was nominated to the Federal Reserve Board as a governor. He was first appointed Chair of the Federal Reserve in 2018 and reappointed for a second term in 2022. In all of the roles he's had in public service, he has been a steadfast steward of the U.S. economy, always considering what's best for the most people and what has the most durable lifespan, building something that lasts. In these roles, he has also held to a simple thing, that we want to ensure that we're always bringing ourselves back to what matters the people of the economy, and the commitments we make. And I think these qualities have helped him lead the unprecedented and powerful actions the Federal Reserve took to support the, the economy through the pandemic and ensure we had full access to credit that could help with navigating through that challenging time, and then allowed him to lead us through one of the most aggressive interest rate campaigns in history to bring down the high inflation that came after the pandemic. In all of those journeys, the simple truth was that Chair Powell thought focused on one thing. How do we do the work we have to do 
with as little hardship on the people of the economy as possible. Again, building something that was meant to last. But his special talent, and you'll hear this today, is his ability to speak plainly about complicated and complex topics. And this has been an especially important attribute in the past few years, when so many households and businesses, families across America, have been struggling to manage high inflation, in rising interest rates, and fears of recession. That's a lot of instability. And hearing from the chair on a regular basis and in plain English has conveyed transparency, agility, and most importantly, resolute commitment to keep working until the job is well and truly done. Now, personally, I know the chair, Jay, to be a voracious learner, ever curious, never satisfied, and then coupling that with something else that is rarely seen together, and that is to be a listener, equally able to digest and utilize cutting-edge research, market inputs, and what the lived experiences are of families and businesses. And he takes all of that together to craft the best policy he possibly can to meet our given goals. All of these always and ever in service to the American people. So leading that discussion with Chair Powell will be Kai Rizdahl. Now you all know Kai from his voice on Marketplace and for the way he unpacks economic finance and policy news all of the day into something that is more than just the ticker stream or a thread on Twitter or I guess called X. He also makes it fun, which is more than is often much needed at the end of the day. So what's remarkable about Kai is if you think about his uh, thing, he didn't start in broadcasting. He was actually in the Navy, then in the Foreign Service, and finally an intern at KQED where he launched what is now his career. When Kai has this point at the end of Marketplace where he says, let's do the numbers, it actually is a very brief segment of the entire program. It's what we expect of him to do the numbers. But as you'll hear today in the conversation, what he's really after is to know why are things happening and who is being affected. So with that, gentlemen, I would ask you to come to the stage for what I expect to be a very important conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. <clears throat> yeah, right? There, there's the news. Fed chair falls off stage. <laughs> if Fed chair doesn't fall off stage. That's, that's, right, that's, right, that's right. Keeps his footing. Uh, good morning. And good morning, Chair Powell. Good morning. Um, Thank you for taking the time. Uh, we have, give or take, 45 minutes. Um, so I'm going to jump right in with the data of the morning. PCE came out this morning. You had it yesterday, 2.8% at the core. Here's my question. You saw it yesterday. What was your first thought? My first thought was that uh, the, the report that uh, came out this morning is pretty much in line with our expectations. Uh, so. Core PCE, as you mentioned, is at 2.8% on a 12-month basis. Mm -hmm. Headline is at 2.5%. That's what we were expecting. And it's, it's good to see something coming in in line with expectations. So as you and, and your colleagues uh, at the Fed and, and at the regional uh, banks have been saying, we want more data, more good data. Is this that? Is this in that bucket? Well, um, so... Uh, Let's take a step back. Over the course of the, of the second half of last year, we got what I would definitely consider good data right. uh, over the course of seven months. And uh, uh, then in January of this year, we got a very high reading, uh, much higher mm -hmm. reading on inflation. And so February is lower, but it's not as low as most of the good readings we got in the second half of last year. But it's definitely more along the lines of what we want to see. What we, so what we've said is that we, we don't see it as likely to be appropriate that we would begin to reduce uh, interest rates until the committee, the Federal Open Market Committee, is confident that inflation is moving down to 2% on a sustained basis. And what do we need to, to get that confidence? It's just more good inflation readings, like the ones we were getting last year. With all possible respect, you all all of you have been saying the same thing for now six months, right? We want more good data. 
What do you suppose it does to the listening public and to the professionals who are listening to this when you keep saying the same thing? So we're, you know, we, we're steady. Uh, our hand is a steady hand in this. We've been saying all through last year and this year that we're making progress. We, we've noted that progress. We haven't overreacted to it. We didn't overreact to the good data we had in the second half of last year. You heard us saying that this is good, but we need to see more. And, the, and, and you, you won't hear us overreacting to these two months that are higher. The reason that's important is that the decision to begin to reduce rates is a very, very important one because the risks are two-sided. If we, if we reduce rates too soon, there's a chance that inflation would pop back and we'd have to come back in, and that would be very disruptive. That would not be the, a good thing for the economy. There's also a risk that we would wait too long and that, that would, we would, uh, you know, in that case, it could be un, unnecessary unneeded damage to the economy and perhaps the labor market. Why would it be terrible if you reduce interest rates by, you know, 25 basis points, quarter percentage point, and then the data changes and, and you have to change your mind? Why is that terrible? It doesn't, it wouldn't need to be terrible. And you're, you're right. We, we always have to be humble that we, we actually, uh, it, the, the, the outlook is always much more uncertain than, than most people think, including us. The, the economy can and often has recently performed in unexpected ways. So we're ready for that. And if that's what happens, that's what we'll do. But it's important to get this right. The other thing, though, is with the economy, you know, growth is strong right now. The labor market is strong right now. And inflation has been coming down. We can and we will be careful about this decision because we can be. Say more about because you can be. You got nothing but time, basically? Is that what? No, the economy is strong. We see very strong growth. We had uh, growth for last year over 3%. Uh, many forecasters see growth coming down to around 2% this year. That, that's about what, roughly what the first quarter looks like. That means that we don't need to be in a hurry to cut. It means we can wait and, and become more confident that, in fact, inflation is coming down to 2% on a sustainable basis. So this is kind of a subjective question, but then why then do you think people are screaming, not for your heads, but f close, but, but for you to cut interest rates so much? Well, I mean, we have... I would say we've we've divided our critics into sort of e equal sized piles at this point. Um, there there are plenty. There's plenty of uh, uh, people who think that uh, you know that we shouldn't be cutting now. The, the, but I, the point is this: we haven't reduced interest rates. What we've said is we want to be more confident before we take that step. And and I think I actually think we are monetary policy is well placed to react to a range of different. Uh, pass for the data. And that's, that's really what you want. You want to be in a position where you can react, not just to the base case, but if you get a case where inflation progress slows or where, uh, or where the economy weakens, you're also in a position to, to react to that. And we are. When you sit around the table at, at, the, at the Fed or on your Zooms or however you're doing it now, do you have conversations about, about how your desire to be more confident is received by Yes, the market's an analyst, fine, but everybody else? So I'd say, the, yeah, the answer is yes, of course, but the main focus is on getting it right. Getting it right is the most important thing by orders of magnitude. If, if you get it right, then everything else falls into place. So, I mean, you're talking about market reaction and things like that. You know, we, we look at that, of course, but ultimately, uh, monetary policy works with a lag, and you want to make the right decisions, and you want the committee to be in a place so that if things work out differently than the base case, you're, you're, you're not out of position. And I, as I said, I think we're in position now where, we, where we, are, we can handle whatever case comes. Can we talk briefly about that first cut, which, which you mentioned, right? That's going to be significant. It came up at your last press conference after the meeting. Um, how important is unanimity to you on that? Um, unanimity as such, so I, I, don't, I don't know any Fed chairs who, who were you know, hoping for dissents. <laughs> it's not something you, you want. But at the same time, what, the, the way I think about it is this. You, you talk to people, I talk to all the people on the committee uh, before each meeting in depth. And you listen to people, you hear them, you try, to, you, you try to get in their thinking and understand it. And you try to incorporate that to the maximum extent you can in the decision and the way we talk about it. And if you do that, you know, people generally feel, they feel consulted, they feel that, that their views are being considered and reflected. And they, they, they may choose to dissent. That happens all the time. It's, it's not a problem when people dissent. It's hap it happens, and, and, you know, life goes on. Do you literally, like, go knock on their doors or call them on the phone? 
Like you call Mary or, or whoever? Yes, I have. Well, I have scheduled calls with every uh, every voter and non-voter on the on the FOMC before every meeting, and, and not infrequently, I'll have a, I'll have another round of calls before that, and not infrequently, I will have just calls. Um, just I just talk to various people on the committee during that six or seven month six or seven week uh, intermeeting period. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the Fed as an institution then for a second, since we're talking about the people and 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 how it all happens. Um, it is, um, some may argue, uh, one of the significant economic institutions in this government that actually works, right? Congress is a whole different deal. The president's concentrating on his re-election campaign. The Fed as an institution works, and you said to Scott Pelley, I think, uh, on 60 Minutes, you know, <clears throat> integrity is all we have. Um, how mindful are you of the Fed's uh, credibility at a time which is precarious for you? So the Fed is, is a, to me, is a very important American institution that serves all Americans on a non-political basis. And what, what people can expect from us is that we will do our work with painstaking care, we'll understand the theory, we'll understand the data, we'll, we'll look at the, think about the outlook, and we'll make our decisions based on that and on nothing else. We will not be making decisions particularly about political calendars or anything like that. We'll all, we'll, you know, we don't always get it right, no one does, but uh, that's what we'll do. So it's, it, integrity is, at the, it, it is, the, is everything. For Ultimately in life, integrity is everything. But for us, integrity is everything because even, if, even when we don't get it exactly right, people have to believe, and, and it's true, that we, we're, we're doing the, the absolute best we can in a very transparent way based on the data, based on our understanding of the economy and the outlook for the economy. It's tremendously important that people understand that about the Fed and that we're working to serve all Americans, not any particular set of Americans or political parties or leaders. You've talked uh, previously about humility. You've said the word humble already this morning once. Um, I was talking to Neil Kashkari at the Minneapolis Fed the other day, and he said, you know, this economy is really tough to diagnose, so it's hard for us to know what's going on. Talk to me about humility in the face of, and we were talking about this backstage, about an economy that is still um, really, really hard to figure out what's going on. So economic forecasters are a humble lot, generally, with much to be humble about. <laughs> that's funny. That's not my experience with economic forecasters. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, yeah, the, the pandemic era has, of course, been uh, full of surprises. Uh, if you go back to the beginning, I think almost all of mainstream macro analysts thought that the this, that this was different and that because of the, of the obvious supply side, Problems, the collapse of the of supply chains and things like that. There was a group who didn't diagnose it that way, but if that's the case, then we thought that our very dynamic economy would would uh, recover pretty quickly. That people would go back to work, kids would go back to school, and the economy would be fine, and and there wouldn't be any need, much of a need for us to intervene, except sort of during that early period to get the economy, you know, keep it from collapsing during the actual intense phase of the pan, acute phase of the pandemic. So that, that didn't happen. Uh, inflation came up, stayed up, and it took a long time to heal. And then it didn't really heal. The, the supply side didn't really heal in 2022. And we were thinking, well, maybe it's not going to heal. And then it did. And you, so you, the labor force, labor force participation, workers came back into the labor force in 2023. And also the supply chains healed in 2023. So right about the time we were thinking maybe this isn't going to happen, it really happened a lot in 2023, which is part of the story of why, why the economy did so well last year was, was supply-side healing. So now we have, um, I mean, it, it's just, it's been surprising over and over again. So I think we have to be unusually humble about our ability to foresee the future and be ready for, for different plausible outcomes. I've told you this story, I think, the last time you and I spoke about a conversation I had with, with uh, then-civilian Yellen. It was between her time as chair and treasury secretary. And I asked her why the Fed hadn't been able to get inflation up to where it wanted, where she wanted it to be, where the committee wanted it to be. And she literally looked at me and went, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and I guess my question is, is it, would it be a bad thing for you to say, we don't know, we're doing the best we can? We say that all the time in 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 one way or another. I'll, I'll give you an example. We uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, high inflation in January, somewhat less high uh, inflation in February, and we've been saying that we expect inflation to move down to two percent, but on a path that is sometimes bumpy. So 
the question then is, are those just bumps, or are they something more than bumps? Is, inflation, is progress on inflation going to slow for more than you know, two months? And that's a question, and honestly, we're just going to have to let the data tell us that. There isn't anybody who knows. And uh, so we're, we're, our position is, we don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll tell you what we will do if inflation does come down. And that's sort of the base case. That is what we expect. We expect inflation to come down on a sometimes bumpy path to 2%. But if that doesn't happen, then, then obviously our rate policy will be different. And we, for example, we can, we can hold rates where they are for longer. And that's what we would do, of course, if, if, if inflation doesn't uh, come down, if we don't see the progress we're looking at. So we, we kind of say that all the time. Consensus now is rates are going to be higher for longer. They may or may not come down this year, depending on what the data says. Do you think this economy is ready for a four and a half ish percent inflationary sort of economy, right? Not, not inflation of 4%, but your rates at you know, 4.6, which is where your projections have them? So this is one of the things, um, you know, we've had uh, our policy rate at 5.3%, which is the highest rate in more than two decades for some time. And all, of, all through the course of 2023, we saw very strong growth. Yep. So it's, um, and that's partly because we, it's, this has happened in a context of supply side healing, which makes, makes its own growth, you know, make, when potential output goes up. So we don't really know where, where rates are going to go back to uh, when this whole thing is over. For many years, if you go back to before the global financial crisis, it was, wasn't unusual to see uh, the longer term rates in the, in the fours. And so are we going to go back to, whereas in the, in, in the sort of time between the global financial crisis and the pandemic, rates went lower and lower and lower, and it wasn't unusual to see in other countries long-term rates below zero, even, mm-hmm. in Europe. They never went that low in the United States, but they went very low. So are they going to go back up to those higher levels of the pre-global financial crisis? We, we really don't know. Um, we, so we think that the factors that, that led rates that really came down over a 40-year period, mostly related to big, slow-moving things like demographics, aging population, which saves more, and, and productivity, low productivity, and things like that. Those things don't jump around. They're, they're sort of slow-moving objects. Um, but the truth is we don't know. My, my own expectation is I don't think rates will go back down to the very, very low levels they were at before the pandemic but where they will turn out to settle out, it's hard to say. It, this, this economy doesn't feel like it's suffering um, from the current level of rates, although in, if you look at things like uh, inflation-sensitive spending, then right. those parts of the economy are really feeling the high rates. Not to pick at a scab, but what I hear you saying is, uh, while inflation may or may not have been transitory, rates are not actually going to be transitory. They're going to be higher for a while, and they people might just be, need to get used to that. They, they, that might be the case. I don't know. I, I don't think late rates will go back to the very historically low right. levels that they were at before the pandemic hit. I do think uh, rates will come down from, are likely to be lower than they are, at least short-term rates are lower than they were right, right now. But I mean, we're going to let the data, we're going to have to let the data tell us the answer to that. Uh, I want to go um, to the labor market for a minute. Uh, something you said at, at your last press conference sort of caught a lot of people's ears, and that was uh, when you said, um, we are very attentive to both sides of the mandate, which is to say full employment uh, and stable prices. And, and people picked up on that because you had been very keyed in on, on the price stability aspect. And I guess I wonder now why you're becoming more aware or publicly saying you are more aware of unemployment? I'll tell you why. So if, um, we, have two, we have two mandates, as you know, uh, maximum, employment, maximum employment and price stability. And when one of those uh, mandates is, is far from its goal, then, and the other one isn't, you focus on the one that's far from its goal. And, that, and that's, that's actually in our uh, document that codifies right. the way the, our framework. So that was the case um, from the middle, late 2021 until, as, at, until inflation started coming down. And so we focused very hard on inflation, and you heard us talking about inflation. But headline inflation just a year ago was, was I guess, um, 5.2% on a 12-month basis. Now it's 2.5%. And core, I think, has come down from 4.8 to 2.8. So you've seen really significant progress. Just as a natural thing then, the work's not done. Our goal is 2%. But as that happens, the, the risks to the two goals come into better balance. 
They're mm -hmm. coming into better balance. And that means we are a dual mandate bank under law. That means that we now, we now that, that thing we were doing, we were just thinking about inflation, that's no longer appropriate. So we're thinking about both. We're thinking about the risks to both now, and we should be. That's, that's, that's our job under the law. And so, uh, you know, we, I, we we're very committed to getting inflation down to 2%. Having it down to 2% is critical if we're going to have the kind of long expansions that, that really benefit all Americans in the workplace. At the same time, uh, it, if we were to see unexpected weakness in, in the labor market, then that's something that, that we would be looking at carefully and could draw a response as well. A policy response, clearly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, What's the monster under your bed? What keeps you up at night? Other than inflation, you don't get the same inflation. Inflation? No, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I would say this. We are we're at a place where the economy is strong, without question. The labor market's in a good place. We've, we've got you know, uh, uh, inflation, uh, sorry, unemployment under 4% for more than two years now, for the longest time in 50 years, and we've had progress on inflation. So we want to use our tools in a way that keeps... Uh, you know, the strength in, in the economy and in the labor market, but allows for further progress in inflation. That's, that's our focus. And, you know, we, we clearly have a chance at that outcome. And, you know, we're all very, very focused on doing everything we can to deliver that outcome. It would be a great outcome for the American people. And it would be testimony to how unusual the circumstances are. Soft landing, transitory, words that I imagine you don't let be said uh, in your presence very much. Here's another one that hasn't been said at a, at a press conference that you've had since December, recession. Do you think a recession's off the table? So there's, all, there's always a sort of um, unconditional probability of a, of a recession in, in, in the next year. And so the real question is, if you look through history, uh, it's not possible to rule a recession out for a long period of time. So granted, but you know real, what I, you know what I meant, right? Real, yeah. No, the yeah. real question is is the is the possibility of a recession elevated at the current time? And I would I would say no. I I don't and I, I don't see forecasters disagreeing with that. Growth is strong, as I mentioned. The economy is in a good place, uh, and the, the, there's no reason to think the economy is in a recession or is at, at the edge of one. But humility, understood. Last time you were on the Hill, somebody asked you whether there was going to be, whether you were going to come out and declare victory. You were going to say, yeah, yeah, we did it, we're done. And you said, absolutely not, that's not what we do. Will you not at some point, though, when you get inflation to 2%, say, inflation's at 2%, we've done our job, things are stable, and life is good? I don't want to speculate about that. You know, we'll jinx it. Right. Guys. So I'm, I'm such a superstitious person, but... No, look, we'll always, we'll, always say, we'll, we'll always tell you what we're seeing in the economy, and if, if we get to that place, that'd be a great. That'd be a great outcome for the public. That's the main thing. We talked uh, very briefly backstage about um, after the Fed, what you're going <clears> to <throat> do, because you have two years left, give or take. Um, as we sit here in the Yellen Conference Center at the San Francisco Fed, where do you think the Powell Conference Center is going to be? <laughs> um, and, and what do you think your legacy is going to be? First, first line of your New York Times obit. I, I'll tell you the thing that I, that I care about the most, and that is the, the Federal Reserve as an institution, as I mentioned, is an incredibly important American institution, especially right now, because you know, we are that place. We aspire to be that place that transcends politics, divisive politics. And I think, in a way, we are helping hold this thing together by doing what we do the way we do it. And I, I, I want to be, I feel accountable and responsible for the institution and delivering it to the next generation of leaders and people uh, in, in a way that it can still serve the American public the way the Fed does. So I wasn't actually going to go to politics this morning because you have a, a well-practiced answer to that question, but I feel like I kind of have to now that you brought it up twice. Um, it is possible that the Fed is, likely even, that the Fed is going to become more politicized this year. Uh, and the first time you and I spoke in 2018, you were uh, in, in the crosshairs of the president and the administration, and I asked you about it, and you said, you know what, control the controllable. Can't do anything about it. So the question is not what are you going to do about the politics of it. The question is, what is your fear for the economy if the Fed becomes politicized? 
It just wouldn't. We wouldn't be the Fed. And the, but the good news is we are the Fed. You know, you you. Well, no, 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 no. That's 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 not answering the question. No, a a a, a central bank that is that is uh, excessively responsive to. You, you have to look at other countries, basically. And what you, what you see is there's no credibility. You, you, credibility on inflation and on sticking to your knitting is everything. Because if, if people believe that you, are, that you will accomplish your goals and, 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 that you'll, and that you won't deviate from them for reasons like that, then it'll be easier to do so. Markets will, will react appropriately and in people's thinking... Uh, inflation should be around two percent, and if that if they think that way, then it probably will be around two percent. So if you it's if you look at at, at other at, I think of more emerging countries where they have weaker independence or a lack of independence, it's just you know it's it, you can't it's hard to have price stability or maximum employment. So that's what would happen if if that were to happen. But it's I, I'll insist upon saying that's not the world we live in. Fair enough. One more question along those lines, and then I'll I'll leave it uh, be. Um, you don't comment on fiscal policy. This is not a question about fiscal policy. It's a question about what the Fed will do if our current fiscal path, which many have called unsustainable, including Chair Yellen when she was chair and in the interregnum, um, what do you do if our fiscal path continues? What, what, what does the Fed have to think about? We, we're always going to uh, do what we need to do with our policy tools to achieve the goals Congress has assigned to us. And that means maximum employment and price stability. So we're, we're not going to be thinking, gee, we shouldn't raise rates for fiscal reasons. We're never doing that. We're always going to use our tools, and we're always going to assume that the fiscal authorities can run their side of it and can get it under control. And I, I mean, I think it's um, what I said and what Ben Bernanke said and what Janet said, and I'm sure Alan Greenspan said before him, is we're not on a sustainable fiscal path. That's an uncontroversial statement. And... The sooner we get on that path, the better. Back on that path. Uh, a word here about the balance sheet. You said you're going to slow the runoff and, and um, sort of keep an eye on things and, and how they go. Does it suggest a worry about the economy that you're going to slow the runoff of the balance sheet? Not at all. So we, we published a um, – the thing about the balance sheet is we want to be highly transparent and predictable. It's not the main story about monetary policy. The main story is, is interest rates. What happens is when we get into a diff very difficult situation like the pandemic or the global financial crisis, we buy treasuries to lower interest rates and to support the economy. And then we're left with a bigger balance sheet, and we start to then, when the time is right, let it run off and shrink back to where it needs to be. So that's what we're doing. And what we said was, at a certain point, we would slow the pace. And the reason is, um, it's moving down quickly. We've, we've decreased the size of the securities portfolio by a trillion and a half dollars over the course of the last while, year and a half, not even year and a half. Uh, and so we, um, uh, we've said that we would slow the pace. And what we're trying to do there is try to actually get further without, without being disruptive. The, the last tightening cycle for the mm -hmm. sheet ended when we, we suddenly found ourselves that we'd gone too far. And it was very disruptive to markets, and we had to buy treasuries to create more reserves in the economy. So we, this time, we've, we tried to learn from our first experience with shrinking the balance sheet. And this time, we said we would slow at a certain point. But that's, we're going to get to the same point or even lower than we would have. And it's not at all in any way related to a concern about the economy. It's our plan. Uh, on, on that word transparency, which you, you've mentioned a couple of times, um, and on, on your policy and your predecessor's policy and, and those of the committee and the Board of Governors of, of transparency and giving forward guidance and letting everybody know what you're thinking and what your plan is, um, why? So this, the old school was uh, tell them nothing, you know, be mysterious about it. And then a bunch of scholars 40 years ago, people like Alan Blinder and others, thought about it and said, you know, if the public understood your reaction function, the way you would react to different kinds of data, then that'll make your job easier because markets will they'll go, oh, I see. The data came in. Let's say that some data comes in hot. Data comes in hot. The Fed will do X. So we'll react that way. So in effect, the, the markets and the public will understand what you're doing is, is a good thing. And that was very novel. So, that, so the, the path went from tell them nothing. The Fed didn't even announce 
what it did mm -hmm. at an FOMC meeting mm -hmm. until 1994. The first post-meeting statement that's saying, hey, we raised rates or we didn't, was 1994. So from there, you have a straight line, really, of increasing transparency to the point where you are now, where <clears throat> you see a lot of transparency. Some people say it's too much. But <clears throat> the, uh, that's the idea. And I think you've gotten to a place where we try to be so clear in, in what we're doing that the public will understand what we're doing and why and, and that that actually helps our policy be more effective. Humor me. What happens if uh, in, the, in, well, everybody's anticipating a cut in June, but what happens if uh, uh, you guys out of nowhere came out and, and at 11 o'clock Pacific time, I know it's different for all of you in different time zones, um, the statement came out and said, we cut 25 basis points today without having given anybody a heads up. What do you think happens? Nothing good. I mean, I think we would... Seriously? Well, well what happens... Everybody goes, yay, rate cut. No, no, no. But we would, you know, look, our, we are careful, thoughtful. Uh, we're steady hand. So, if we did things like that, it would, be, it would be very much not the way we do business. No, it wouldn't. But play it out for me. What do you suppose happens? Seriously, humor me. I think, I think if we did something like that, markets would, would say, we thought we understood the Fed. We've spent years... Someone would go on TV and said, I've spent 30 years watching the Fed, and I don't understand this at all. Why'd they do it? In other words, you don't, doing an off-cycle rate cut it, 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 like at a time like that, it's just something that would never happen. Uh, I mean, if there were a reason. So we, we, you know, when the pandemic right. hit, Those we, all know. we did yeah. two off-cycle meetings in one cycle. And, and then we canceled the actual meeting. So just and look what happened then. Well, no, that was that was needed. a pandemic. That was Sorry, what needed to happen. That was what needed to happen. Do, do you worry that the <laughs> Fed gets covered too much, especially now when when we're all trying to parse your every word? Gets covered too much like a like a horse race, kind of. There's a little bit of who's in front. Polls say this. What are they going to do? Yeah, I do worry about that. I, you know, I think that the, the things that really matter for our economy over the long term are not the Fed's interest rate decisions. That which really have no impact on the, over the things say, that matter on the Say law. that again. Seriously, say it for the cameras. <laughs> no, okay. The things that matter for the United States economy over the medium and longer term, term are not the decision the Fed makes. It, the, the Fed, the Fed uh, tries to guide the economy to maximum employment and price stability through a, through a business cycle and can react. We do critical things during crises. We're, we're very, very important in crises. But things that, that add to the productive capacity of the United States, things that give people more skills so they can contribute more to the economy, things that, that increase productivity so that an hour's work is worth more output. That's, that's the evolution of technology. It's also the skills that people have. Those things, investing in those things, that's what drives the longer-run growth and the longer-run economic well-being of our citizens, not the things that the Fed does. What we do is very important in, in maintaining stability and, and smoothing out the business cycle and also crisis response, but we don't work on those really far more important longer run issues. Apologies to those of you on the live stream, live stream and, and who are gonna hear this later on the radio. Is Professor Swanson in the room? Sir, I'm sorry, I'm gonna steal your thunder. There, there's, a, there's a panel coming up this afternoon, sir, at 125, the title of which is, Speeches by the Fed Chair are more important than FOMC announcements. An Improved High-Frequency Measure of U.S. Monetary Policy Shocks by Professor Swanson at the University of California, Irvine, and some others. Agree or disagree? <laughs> Pass. <laughs> no, I look forward to I saw I saw that on the agenda. I look forward to I'm not going to come in here and embarrass you by being here, but I will, uh, I will read the paper. Um, but, but to that general point, do, do you get too much press? It's not for me to say, but I, I do think... It is know, for you to say. I, it's I literally for you to I say. Think there's, I do. I absolutely think there's too much focus. If you, uh, if you think about the things that are really important in the economy, things like trade and what we should be doing, some of the things that we're doing that the administration has done, they're far more important over the medium and longer term than monetary policy is. Uh, although it's important that there be... It's important there be a Fed that has a good framework of monetary policy that's well understood... Very important that we do our job, but don't, don't get me wrong. It is important, but it, it, absolutely the things that the other things are, are more important over a long period of time for the people we all serve. I, uh, around the last time you and I spoke in 2022, I also talked to uh, 
Chair Bernanke about his book, and I asked him whether you two ever talk on the phone, and he said, yeah, you know, he calls me every now and then, mostly he imagines, uh, as a courtesy to him. And I said, well, Jay Powell's a good guy, he probably just calls you. Um, and, and he said, you know, when, when Jay was new to the Fed, he used to come down to my office on a Saturday morning uh, with another governor or two, and, and we would just talk about monetary policy as, as he was trying to learn. Um, and, and I guess my question is, do people come to you now? Oh, well, they don't necessarily, I don't, I don't go to the office on Saturday anymore, but Ben used Good. to go, ben, ben was in the office on Saturday, and, and when I was a new governor, so was I. So, and I, I took the advantage of the fact that he was there in his office, and, and we could chat. It's a much more relaxed way. I talk to people, I work at home now on, on the weekends, and I talk to, I talk to all kinds of people all weekend long, yeah. Who, who do you go to, though, for, for counsel? Well, I talk to my colleagues on the FOMC. I talk to senior staff. I, I talk to the formers. I talk to both, you know, Janet is now Treasury Secretary, so that's a different thing. But I check in with Ben. I check in with other former Fed people. I can't, you know, you can't, you, you can't get, this, the group of people that you can really talk to is pretty small. But I do take advantage of that. Why wouldn't I? <clears throat> Back to Kashkari for a minute and, and the interview I did with him. What? Explain that. What? A little chuckle. <laughs> you said back to Kashkari. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Neil's an interesting guy. Um, one of the things we were talking about was uh, consensus. I, I mentioned that before. Do you worry about groupthink around the table? Talk to me about the strength of the conversations, I guess. That's the question. So this, right? this the robustness is a of the debate. This is a virtue of our, um, our federated system. So we have 12 reserve banks. Each reserve bank... Um, has its own economic staff, and they have traditions. Some, uh, you know, that that they follow or don't follow. But in any case, you have, you sort of have a guaranteed institutional diversity of perspectives. Institutionally guaranteed diversity of perspectives. People come in and they they're going to have different views, and I th I think that's absolutely critical. And I, I do think it. I, you know, the fact that we were able to get a unanimous decision on something doesn't mean there wasn't there weren't different views. Also, remember before the vote. There's a lot of discussion that goes on to try to arrive at a plan that get that people can get behind. So it's not, you know, that 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 also tends to minimize. Sorry, let me just pick up on that. Is it is it is it baked before you guys get in the room it's, on no, the Tuesdays and Wednesdays? It's not fully baked, but yes, you do a lot to. Of course, my my part of my job is to know what people think and and uh, to come to the committee with something that has really broad support. And, and, and I, that's, that's, that's part of the thing that I do. But we do have different perspectives. Um, and that, that's really healthy. You know, I, I was an investor for, for quite a while. And, you know, the, it, it, when everyone agrees that something is a great investment, you got you to really worry. You want somebody who's really smart to, to explain why it's not so that you can go through the process of hearing the case against. And I, and I, think, I think it's really helpful to hear... Uh, Different views, so that you can sort of test your own perspective. If everybody agrees, that you, you know, it can be kind of flabby. It hasn't really been tested. Mary Daly in the introduction was was talking about your special talent. That you're a listener, you're a consensus builder. Uh, what what is your special talent? Why do you think you have this job? Why do I have this job? Uh, Don't ask me, man. <laughs> I, you know, it uh, it's not, when I got to the Fed in 2012. I didn't, I, of course, I had no idea what was to come. I, you know, I will say what I, what I try to do on, on, on listening is, uh, I, I think if you, again, if you, if you do listen to people and they understand that you're hearing them and not just kind of t explaining things to them, and they get that and they feel listened to and heard from, for most people, most of the time, that's going to be enough for them to go along, even if they don't like a decision. It also... It builds relationships. So you know, I've spent I spent a great deal of time with our uh, oversight committees and beyond that on Capitol Hill, and mo more so than my predecessors. And I think, it, you know, the, they they see the Fed as I want them to see the Fed as what it is, which is this non political agency that doesn't run talking points at them and isn't political and is just doing our work and staying out of the political issues. And you know, I'm in their offices listening to what they say, and I think they really appreciate that. Yeah, but do you think it's working? What? Your effort to get them not to see you as a political agency and just doing the, the best by the American much, people. Much better than you would think. I mean, I think there's a certain amount of, of, 
of low noise on that subject. But if you talk to people privately, I think they're I think that that, that has if an independent Fed has very broad support in both parties on both sides sides of the hill. Uh, I'll appreciate you're going to want to be discreet on this question, but what's running through your head when you're at the green table in front of a Senate or a House committee? I'm trying like to listen, your internal listen hard to find the the que- to get the question, and yeah. you know sometimes the questions are more like speeches, you know, and um, or they're not really questions, or they're not quite the right question, and I so I try to find the good question and give the good answer to that question. Also, respect, you know, they we in our system of government, they they are our oversight, and our democratic legitimacy runs right through transparency and right through their. Um, you know their actions of of holding us accountable and and being explain us explaining to them what we're doing and why. So we, we answer any and all questions that they uh, that they may have, and uh, that's so. I work hard to get ready for those with a lot of help from people, and uh, we take them very seriously. Uh, banking regulation, <clears throat> new regulations are in the works. Banks are not happy about it. From <clears throat> excuse me, from Wall Street down to community bankers that I talk to. Um, What's your confidence level about, first of all, about the banking system right now, uh, and then about the need for more regulation? Can you fix what you think is wrong? Sure. So I, I would say the banking system is, is in a good place now. Uh, a little over a year ago, we had, we had a period of stress. I think things have settled down significantly. I think banks are lending. I think um, you know, we focused uh, a lot of attention during that period and since on Banks that had uh, things like uh, CRE, commercial real estate mm-hmm. losses, uh, or perhaps funding structures that needed to be supported more, and we work with a ton of banks to address those issues. And I, so I think that I think the banking system is, is is definitely in a good place. I think the commercial real estate problem will be with us for some years, but it, and it is a, it is just a question that some banks, and it's mostly small banks. It's definitely not the very large banks right. have. Have concentrations of commercial real estate, and it looks like they will be realizing losses over time. And we're working with them to make sure they have enough capital that they that they do understand the losses, and so that they can work through this. And so that's what we're doing. And you know, again, that process will play out, and I think that'll be okay. You know, I talk to a community banker every now and then uh, up in Seattle, and she basically, I, I think she, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but I will. I don't think she would characterize it as working with. I think she would characterize it as the Fed's telling us what to do. And I guess I wonder what your response is to that. Well, supervisors, you know, we have a job, which is to make sure that banks are understand and can manage their risks. And, uh, you know, it can, e- it can be either of those things. It, it can sometimes, certainly supervisors have to at some point say, you got to do this. And that's, that's one of the lessons of the Silicon Valley Bank situation was uh, a need to be forceful when when it's appropriate. Sorry, let me dig in on that just a little bit. Um, forceful is one thing. Well, let me phrase it a different way. Um, how can Do you need to convince the banks that you're working with them, or can you just say, you got to do it, sorry? So I think, I, I've never worked as a bank supervisor, so, but I, what, what I... What I, what I believe is this. Bank supervision uh, can tend to be pretty process-oriented. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, there's a, there's a playbook, there's a checklist, and that's a good thing because you want the banks, it, it, it wants to be transparent so that they know what's expected so they can do what's expected. But it can also be slow when it needs to be fast. And so the art of it, and there, there's definitely an element of art in, in this thing, and some people are just very, very good at it, and, and others less so. But you can see, um, the art of it, though, is to is for them banks to understand. Generally, banks, you know, that bank banking is different from many other industries. They, you know, they, it is a heavily regulated and supervised industry, and they, you know, particularly the larger institutions, they have ongoing daily uh, interactions with their regulators and supervisors. What's What's important is that is that the banks are well capitalized, that they understand their risks and they can manage them, that they have adequate liquidity, that if they have good resolution plans. And our job is to, is to make sure that that's the case. The, the more the banks take that on themselves and, and do a great job at it without us pushing them, the less we need to push. The international situation. The United States is doing better than every developed economy, I believe, in the world by a good measure. Um, what do you make of that? And how does it affect your decision making? So I do, you know, I'm do a, 
a fair amount of my job is uh, going to these international meetings, either in Basel or, or uh, whoever's running the G7 or the G20 in a given year. And, uh, and that, is the, that is what people are talking about, is the, you know, the sort of exceptionalism right now of the U.S. economy, how strong the U.S. economy is. And um, there's no question that we, we are performing very well. I think it, you know, part of it just is um, I mean, productivity is a key thing. It, it, the Europeans are very focused right now on not just their short-term low productivity, but you know, what can they do to have uh, greater productivity growth over time? This is a big focus for the European economic officials at the highest level. Mario Draghi is doing a report on it, and the finance ministers that I talk to from the big countries, this is their focus. And so it's tremendously important. And, and you know, people, so people are thinking about what, what can we do. Some of the things they're looking at doing are, sound like the United States, like having a, having a flexible labor market and having a, um, a very active uh, you know, financial sector that can fund you know, early stage or, or small companies well. So it's very important. And uh, so, yeah, the U.S. is doing the, the performance of the U.S. economy in the last year or so has been, been quite strong. Does that affect how you do your job? Yes, <laughs> it does. Discuss. Well, um, I'm have to take the punch away. seriously? Apparently. <laughs> oh man. I know it goes sorry, fast. Sorry, when you're sorry. Good I, time. I, my job is to hit a time post, and I can't even do that. Well, apparently not. Apparently. No, but I'm I'm your helper. <laughs> I am on stage, ready to help you. Sorry, so, Mary. Chair Powell, I'll turn it back to you. As I mentioned earlier, the fact that the U.S. economy is growing at such a solid pace. The fact that the labor market is, you know, still very, very strong gives us the chance to just be a little more confident about inflation coming down before we take the important step of cutting rates. And so we're not going to take that step until we are confident. We don't think it'll be appropriate to do so, I should say. But um, that's, that's the way it plays into what we're doing. Over to you, boss. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. I, it was a terrific conversation. I appreciate Thanks, it. Mary. Thank you. Appreciate very much. it. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Thank you.